In this video, we are going to talk about the Dialectical Behavior Therapy or DBT Skills Training Module that is devoted to developing distress tolerance skills. Dr. Marsha Linehan, the creator of DBT, says, if you have a problem, you can either solve it using problem-solving skills, change how you feel about it through emotional regulation skills or mindfulness skills, learn to tolerate it through distress tolerance skills, or stay stuck in the problem and be miserable. We will begin by briefly explaining the relevant meaning of the word distress as found at dictionary.com. Distress is a noun that can mean 1. Great pain, anxiety, or sorrow, acute physical or mental suffering, affliction, trouble, 2. A state of extreme necessity or misfortune, and 3. That which causes pain, suffering, trouble, danger, etc. And from the online etymology dictionary, we learn that the word distress is derived from the Latin word districus, the past participle of distringere, which means to draw apart, hinder. Now we have all experienced moments of deep distress where we are hindered and torn apart by events and circumstances in our life. It can be caused by something physical, such as falling down and scraping a knee, or by something emotional, such as despair and anger that arise in such situations, or even the thought of having to buy new pants or tights because the ones we were wearing are now ruined. It is like we are pulled apart and torn to pieces, and we lose our internal balance and equilibrium. Some people are able to pull themselves back together and regain their inner balance fairly easily, but others, especially those suffering from borderline personality disorder or BPD and problems involving emotional regulation, can quickly spiral out of control and be swamped by wave after wave of dark, disturbing emotions that seem endless. Often those who suffer the most attempt to numb themselves through the use of drugs or alcohol, sexual promiscuity, self-harm, such as cutting, bulimia, anorexia, eating too much or not enough, engaging in other high-risk activities, or simply by trying to shut down and hide away from the world. Behaviors that in the long run are self-destructive and will simply make things worse by prolonging the pain and lead to even more distress. Most people can quickly recover their internal balance and get on with their life, while others seem to replay it over and over in their minds, giving it even more strength and power so that it crushes them even more under the weight of such darkness and negativity. Distress can also prevent people from thinking clearly and seeing things in perspective or more objectively. So it is a classic first-person subjective or me, 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 why me state of awareness. Now please note that distress tolerance skills are not designed to help us avoid things that shouldn't be avoided. They are not meant to help us become like ostriches and stick our heads in the sand and hide from life. Rather, they are designed to prevent us from spiraling out of control and making a bad situation even worse. It is also important to make sure that it is not like we are grasping at straws or to use another analogy and hope they will magically help us to right the capsized sailboat. And just as all schools and high-rise office towers are legally required to practice evacuation plans on a regular basis in order to make sure 
everyone knows what to do in an emergency so they do not panic. These skills need to be practiced first so that we are not caught off guard, flailing around, trying to implement them when we need them most. This requires a twofold approach. The first is to create a distress tolerance plan similar to the evacuation plans that all office towers are legally required to have. With office towers, floors, businesses, and sections have to nominate a fire warden who attends preparatory meetings where they systematically go through the evacuation plans. Then they go to their business section or floor where they train everyone, something that involves a lot of thinking and rehearsing in advance. Stretching this analogy further, they are trained to deal with many different situations. But these are not simply conjured out of thin air, but based on things that have happened in the past. And the same applies to us. We simply have to examine our past and examine those events that have caused us to spiral out of control. Perhaps some were like bomb threats, others like gas leaks, armed intruders, smoke, fire, and so on. And so we need to identify where we are vulnerable, the ways in which we have already been triggered, the counterproductive strategies we have used in the past that have only made it worse. And this is actually an ideal exercise for moving from a first-person awareness to a second-person one allowing a little bit of inner detachment to occur as we step back and review the things we have done wrong and possibly even done right. When all we have done is live in a state of first-person attachment deeply embedded in life, it is no wonder we are unable to step back when we really need that inner space and become objective when we need it the most. And here, it is also important to realize that distress tolerance skills can be counterproductive if used in the wrong situation. If a problem can be solved, we should solve it rather than learning how to tolerate it. So for instance, if we hurt someone, rather than beating ourselves up and making it worse or practicing skills that can help us to tolerate this, it would be better to solve the problem by swallowing our pride and apologizing and making amends. Everyone makes mistakes, but some of us deal with them better than others. This may also involve us recognizing it is time to grow up and stop behaving like a child. Now, while we should practice these skills in order to familiarize ourselves with them, so we do not forget them when we need them the most. They are not meant to become crutches, because in the long term, this will make things worse. It is one thing to practice wrapping our ankle up in a tensor bandage during a first aid class, and another to wrap them up every time we go for a walk because we are afraid of hurting them. And although we are discussing distress tolerance skills in isolation from the other DBT or dialectical behavior therapy skills, they cannot be practiced in isolation because they require at least a tiny act of mindfulness in order to be implemented. That is, we must become mindful that we are in a crisis and need these skills. Just the ability to take a dialectical approach and holding up the possibility of solving the problem with one hand and tolerating the problem with the other is a profound act of mindful awareness, one that requires us to step into the present moment in a non-judgmental way. Marsha Linehan, the creator of Dialectical Behavior Therapy, has outlined a number of clear strategies in her DBT skills training program that can help 
those of us who have real trouble rebalancing after such upheavals. Imagine two sailboats in the ocean and a massive storm arises causing the waves to swell. Both boats capsize and get knocked over, but one has a large keel that quickly allows it to right itself, while the other continues to take on water and get knocked around by the swells because it doesn't have a keel or mechanism to right itself. Fortunately, such a boat can be retrofitted with stabilizers that will both help to keep it upright and quickly help to rebalance it if it gets knocked over. Marsha Linehan has found the following tools to be especially effective when coping with distress, and we will go through them one by one. They are distract, improve the moment, self-soothe, pros and cons, radical acceptance. Now we will discuss them one by one, beginning with distract. Marsha Linehan developed DBT to help those people other therapists thought were unhelpable. Those who were suicidal and those who cut, burned, scratched, and harmed themselves. Many people look upon self-harm with horror, believing that this behavior was rooted in self-hatred and self-loathing, and therefore attempting to help self-harmers by dealing with their core esteem issues. One thing that they fail to notice is that when a person cuts themselves, this causes their bodies to produce a whole array of biochemicals that actually causes a high similar to morphine. And so while they are hurting themselves on the one hand and filled with self-loathing and self-hatred, they are also temporarily numbing themselves to pain, much like someone addicted to painkillers does. So self-harm is an extreme example, though totally unhealthy one, of distracting oneself. Just as drugs and alcohol are often a means of distracting oneself from certain emotions. Another frequently overlooked understanding is that emotions are actually generated in the body and we have specific emotional feeling circuits in our body. This means that emotional pain is not just emotional, but it also has a strong physical component. So a broken heart really does physically hurt. It also means that other problems such as anxiety or depression can be every bit as painful as a sprained ankle. And yet, unlike a sprained ankle, it is invisible, and so some need to cut themselves and engage in self-harm in order to make the invisible visible. Research has also proven that when we focus on negative emotions, such as anger, despair, or fear, this causes that emotion to grow more powerful. Even thinking thoughts such as, I do not want to feel so depressed, increases our feeling of depression. So by attempting to push these feelings away, perhaps by sticking our head in the sand, metaphorically speaking, we are really reinforcing them. Fortunately, due to the limited nature of our attention, if we can change the topic and focus on something completely unrelated, perhaps even something joyful or soothing, these feelings will diminish. So distracting is not so much avoiding or hiding away as it is engaging in something healthy and beneficial. So the simplest way to deal with distress is to distract. This is based on the principle that we can only really focus on one thing at a time. And so we can either focus on our pain and darkness and feed it with our attention so that it grows bigger, or we can stop feeding it by focusing on something else. Marsha Linehan developed 
the acronym ACCEPTS to help us better remember some of the more effective ways we can distract ourselves from distress. ACCEPTS stands for activities, contributing, comparisons, emotions, push away, thoughts, and sensations. The A of accepts stands for activities. When we use various activities to distract ourselves from distress, they should be able to really engage our attention. If they require little effort, then it is easy for dark thoughts and feelings to sneak in. It is not enough to say, don't think about it, or stop feeling this way, because then the problem is inherent in the attempt to solve it. Sort of like the old, don't think of a pink elephant, which requires us to first think about a pink elephant in order to make sense of this instruction. So rather than say, I should not think about feeling depressed, or I should not think about feeling anxious, it is better to focus on something else entirely. Now keep in mind that we are all different, and so while one person may be able to distract themselves by getting involved in a game of chess online, another may have to go for a run, and every time their thoughts return to the problem, they should focus on being as mindful as they can of their feet hitting the pavement. So here it is a good idea to experiment and find out what works best for you. And then make a list of activities so that they can be easily recalled. One of the unfortunate things about anxiety and stress is that the higher parts of the brain are often bypassed. This process has been referred to as amygdala hijacking. And so the older, more primitive parts of the brain take over and we draw a blank when trying to think of a distracting activity. This is why preparation and planning ahead and developing a distress tolerance plan is important. Now engaging in some kind of a strenuous physical activity is usually one of the best ways to distract ourselves. Things like jogging, dancing, digging in the garden. In many cases, the more strenuous, the better, especially if they leave you feeling a little exhausted afterwards, because that means they have drained you of some energy, ensuring that this energy cannot be used to dwell on your problem. The next best are complex mental activities, things like learning a new language, doing crossword puzzles, reading a complex book that requires your attention. One of the keys is to either make it so absorbing or so complex that there is little room for other things to bubble up from the back of your awareness. So figure out what works for you and then write them down so that they can be easily recalled at those times you need them most. The first C of accepts stands for contributing. When we are physically ill, as with all animals, we have a tendency to withdraw from the world in order to heal. But when our wounds are emotional, this can create an echo chamber within ourselves that make us feel even worse. As our thoughts and feelings circle around and around, in such inner darkness. One of the easiest ways to forget about our own concerns is to focus on others. We can either do big things such as joining worthy causes, perhaps volunteering at a food bank or seniors home. We can even do little things such as random acts of kindness, perhaps smiling at a harried cashier in a checkout line and saying a few words of encouragement or praise or letting another driver merge ahead of us. The simple act of smiling has been proven 
to help change our feelings, especially if we learn to not only smile with our lips, but also with our eyes. That is to smile with our lips and the ribbon-like muscles that surround our eyes and allow us to squint. Our pituitary glands secrete anxious, stress-related chemicals that push our body into the fight, flee, or submit mode. Or they can produce hormones such as oxytocin, which has been called the bonding molecule. Joining a team and uniting in a good cause can help to change the biochemical soup controlling our emotions in our body. Research on hypnosis and guided meditation shows that even just closing our eyes and sitting quietly for five minutes and using our imagination to visually connect with people and simply imagine contributing to a good cause can lead to changes. The second C of accepts stands for comparisons. Sometimes we need to gain a little perspective when we begin to feel distressed. And here we can compare ourselves to ourselves, or perhaps compare our life now with what it was like before we learned these skills, so that we can see that we really have changed and can continue to do so. We can even compare ourselves with others who are struggling even more or with greater burdens, because no matter how bad we feel, we can always find examples of other people who are dealing with a worse crisis, or even comparing ourselves to other people who have felt worse and managed to pull themselves out of it, giving us hope and a practical example of how things can get better. The E of accepts stands for emotions. Emotions have been described as energy in motion. This is because they never stay the same and are always changing. So no matter what we are feeling in this moment, it will change. Fortunately, as will be outlined in greater detail when we discuss the DBT module emotional regulation, we actually have far more control over our emotions than we believe. As mentioned before, the simple act of smiling with both the lips and the muscles that circle around the eyes and allow us to squint has been proven to lift one's spirits. Music can also have a direct effect on our emotions while also allowing us to be transported into another dimension. Here, it can really pay off to plan ahead by creating a happy playlist for our smartphone, computer, or musical device. And if you play a musical instrument, this can make the effect even more powerful. We can even use music to change our mood by locking the door, closing the curtains, and dancing with abandon for a few minutes until our whole physiology changes. Of course, if we start to practice mindfulness on a regular basis, we can become even more conscious and aware of our body and feelings and how our feelings have a profound influence on the way we move and act. So things such as dragging our feet will prolong dark, heavy feelings while walking with a spring in our step will have the opposite effect. So notice, become mindful of how you can change your feelings by changing the way you move. The P of accepts stands for push away. Another strategy that has been proven effective is to engage in various exercises that help us to push the unwanted distress away. If you are feeling too overwhelmed at the moment and cannot think properly, it is okay to push some problems away. One technique involves the process of visualization 
and imagining taking our distress and locking it in a secure box and putting it on an imaginary shelf. Here, we are not pretending it doesn't exist so much as putting it away until a time we are better able to deal with it. So it is still there in the box waiting for us to come back to it when we are feeling stronger. And this one works better the more we practice it. Now if we have trouble visualizing, we can even write it down on a piece of paper and put it away someplace secure. Of course, when you push your problem away, always make sure to tell yourself you will deal with it tomorrow or at a time when you are better able to deal with it. Perhaps after you have calmed down or had a soothing bath or when you see your therapist or talk to a sympathetic friend, make sure that you do not just push it away and forget all about it because this is only designed to be a temporary solution. Fortunately, your feelings will change and there will be a better time to deal with it. The T of accepts stands for thoughts. Every thought we think is ultimately only a thought and as a thought it can be changed. A classic example is counting to 10 when we are upset or angry. Not only does this give us a little breathing room because we cannot think two thoughts at the same time. So we can either count or ruminate, but not both. Keep in mind that we do not just think in words, but also in pictures and images. So to make this even more effective, Imagine seeing the numbers in nice colors and shapes. Affirmations also work in a similar fashion. And if the distressful incident causes you to think thoughts about harming yourself or what a loser you are or how everyone hates you, perhaps you can change them to loving, validating thoughts instead. Thoughts such as, I love and accept myself as I am right now. And making sure that we add mental pictures, such as visualizing ourself hugging ourself. Other ways of changing our thoughts are to read a book or find inspiring quotes or do a crossword puzzle or even write a positive text message or email and send it to a friend. Another strategy that has been proven very effective is to stop thinking about all of the negative and distressing things that have happened to us and focus our thoughts on things we are grateful for. Perhaps even making a gratitude list of all the things we are grateful for and taking this out and reading it before we go to sleep and when we wake up so that we end and finish the day feeling grateful. We can also write a text message on our phone and send it to ourselves. Perhaps writing and sending it in the morning and opening it in the afternoon. We could even send ourselves one every time we have something to be grateful for so that we can go back and read all of the messages we have sent to ourselves when we really need a boost, perhaps late at night or first thing in the morning. The S of accept stands for sensations. Although this will be covered in great detail, in the section on self-soothing. Just like we can use our thoughts to change our feelings, we can also use our body. Going for a brisk walk, heading to the gym, enrolling in a yoga class, putting on some fast-paced music, and forcing our body to move with joyful abandon can all make us feel better. Researchers have even found that if we are fighting urges to harm ourselves, doing something as simple as holding an ice cube in our hand 
can provide a sufficient distraction and allow us to focus on a harmless experience of pain, watering down the impulse to self-harm and channeling it in a safe way. Emotional freedom technique or EFT or tapping on various acupuncture points on our head, chest, arms, and hands has also helped a lot of people regain control. And when combined with an affirmation or words, especially the phrase, I love myself as I am right now, it becomes even more effective because we are harnessing both thoughts and sensations. The ancient yogic practice of alternate nostril breathing has also helped people regain control. And this is one of our favorites because this technique is particularly powerful because it has also been proven to help balance the brain and lead us to be more even-minded. This is really simple to do and has a profound effect on how we are feeling. It may even be one of the most effective, natural, anti-anxiety treatments we can engage in. We just need to find somewhere quiet where we can sit undisturbed for a few minutes. We can even do it sitting on a toilet seat if that is the only place available. We begin by using the ring or fourth finger of our right hand to close our left nostril while keeping our right nostril open. Then we gently exhale through the right nostril and then inhale back in through this nostril. Then we release our left nostril and close our right nostril with our thumb and then gently exhale and inhale through our left nostril. Then we close our left nostril again with our fourth or ring finger and open our right nostril and then breathe out and then back in through our right before we close that nostril with our thumb and open the left nostril and breathe out and then in again, repeating this process over and over for a few minutes until our body naturally calms down. Now keep in mind that we should practice this before we need it, so we do not have to put a lot of effort into thinking about it and can just do it when we really need it most. Though practicing it is one thing, and actually doing it when we really need it will demonstrate just how powerful and effective this simple technique really is. The next set of distress tolerance skills are found in the acronym IMPROVE, as in improve the moment. The act of distracting ourselves can give us the inner separation we need in order to step back from our swirling storms of distress. But we should also figure out how to make things better here and now and improve the moment. And we do this by focusing on healthy, uplifting, and life-affirming activities that improve this moment so that our life becomes more livable. Marsha Linehan developed the acronym IMPROVE to help us better remember some of the more effective ways we can do this. IMPROVE stands for imagery, meaning, prayer, relaxation, one thing in the moment, vacation, and encouragement. The I of IMPROVE stands for imagery. One of the most powerful and amazing instruments in the entire universe is the human mind and our ability to imagine. There is something called the lemon experience. When people close their eyes and imagine walking into their kitchen, opening the fridge, taking out a lemon, slicing it into four pieces, and taking one slice and biting into it, 
and then noticing how this exercise and imagery causes their mouth to water. Salivating is supposed to be an automatic process that can only be triggered by actual food in our mouth. And yet we are able to hack this physiological process through our imagination alone, revealing how powerful our thoughts really are. Closing our eyes and simply imagining warm sand beneath our body, the sun gently caressing our face, and the smell of salty ocean air can lower our heartbeat and blood pressure and cause various positive chemical changes to occur in our body. However, some people may be a little too sensitive to the sun or had a bad beach experience. So again, it is best to find what works for you. Find that safe place. Perhaps imagining being in your grandmother's kitchen or walking through a forest or smiling with friends or stepping into a healing garden and then imagining the scenario so that it almost becomes a fully formed memory that you can easily access when you need it most. This also highlights something else that is important to understand because when we fill our mind with dark and distressing images, we fill our bodies with all sorts of toxic biochemicals. So we must learn to use our mind to change the biochemical soup in our body, particularly during those stormy periods, in a healthy and beneficial way. The M of improve stands for meaning. Just doing something can give us the distraction we need to deal with distress. But doing something that is meaningful can add a special resonance to this process. Perhaps doing things such as helping others or doing something that will help our career or maybe even doing something major such as finding our purpose in life. This is because our attitude to life changes when we imbue it with meaning. Meaning also allows us to tolerate things we would otherwise find too burdensome. If you believe in God, the gods, a higher power, the divine, you can also add meaning to your life by exploring this belief more deeply, perhaps reading holy books, attending a worship service, connecting with others who share your belief, if you do not believe in a higher power, it might be a good idea to check out humanist organizations and meeting with others who share your belief. Humanists do not work for the glory of God, but to help humanity and this planet and attempt to derive meaning through service to others. We can also look for lessons, extract meaning, focus on uncovering our values and then look for ways to live and express them. We can volunteer and join a cause, work for the environment, help those less fortunate, focus on animal welfare, embrace spirituality, seek out sources of wisdom, seek out truth and meaning, visit a church, temple, mosque, find a community engaged in some form of service, help an elderly neighbor, and live a more meaningful life. The P of improve stands for prayer. Prayer has been defined as a conversation with a higher power or something greater than yourself. Here, it is best to avoid becoming too negative and demoralizing such as using a prayer to bargain or strike a deal or wallow in self-pity by asking, why me? Because these will tend to pull you down and demoralize you. And if you pray for something specific and it does not materialize, this can make you feel cast out and cut off. Though it can really help if you pray for certain qualities, such as stamina, or to be more loving and joyful more tolerant and accepting, more wise and understanding. 
because prayers can cause certain qualities to grow within us. Here, you can even use the metaphor of a lever or seesaw and figure out where you are stuck, perhaps in anxiety or despair, and pray to develop the opposite quality, such as peace and hope, in order to bring more balance back into your life. You can pray for strength, forbearance, compassion, wisdom. You can pray for clarity and meaning. It can even help pull you out of an extreme state of subjectivity where you wallow in self-pity by praying for those you love and those who are less fortunate than you. The R in improve stands for relaxation. There is a difference between relaxation as a noun and the verb to relax. The first is really more like a nebulous state that can mean different things to different people, while the second indicates a process or technique. So while the state of relaxation is the goal, it is much better to focus on techniques and ways to relax. Here you can focus on deep abdominal breathing, the yogic alternative nostril breathing, mastering various progressive relaxation techniques such as the body scan. Keep in mind that the ability to relax, like all skills, can be learned. And so what can be achieved in 20 minutes one month can be achieved in 10 minutes the next and 5 minutes the month after that as you develop greater and greater mastery. It also helps to pay attention to those places where we tend to hold stress in, perhaps our jaw, neck, or shoulders. And so we can consciously work on relaxing these areas. Maybe the tension even starts in our mind and thoughts before it sinks down into our body. And if this is the case, it might even be a good idea to begin or end with mental relaxation. We can also listen to recordings such as mindful body scans, progressive relaxation techniques, and self-hypnosis. Or perhaps engage in strenuous activities such as going to the gym or for a run because this can allow us to quickly work the tension out and help ourselves more fully relax and unwind. Yoga and Tai Chi are also very effective ways to get rid of the tension. So find a local class or even look for lessons on YouTube. The O of Improve stands for one thing in the moment. When we multitask, or get involved in too many things at the same time, this can lead us to feel disjointed, out of balance, and even overwhelmed. Not only does the journey of a thousand miles begin with the first step, each step is separate and unique. And when storms arise and it gets dark and confusing, it helps if we focus on one thing or step at a time and keep it manageable. The V in improve stands for vacation. Taking a vacation is a time-honored way of temporarily stepping out of our ordinary life and taking the pressure off and experiencing new things. Going on a vacation for a few weeks can really help us to recharge our battery and get us back on track. But this isn't always possible. So perhaps we can take a mini vacation, which could be as simple as taking a break, stepping outside for a moment, going for a massage, or deliberately doing something pleasurable. It helps if we make sure to plan little pockets of me time throughout our day, where we can just let go and consciously relax. 
The E of improve stands for encouragement. Humans are social animals, and while we often tend to hide away and shut down when things get too overwhelming, it can help to find people who believe in us and can encourage us to keep going and persevere. Family, partners, friends, and colleagues can all help. This is one of the reasons all 12-step programs involve finding a sponsor and someone to talk to when things get rough. It is also what gives coaching its power. Of course, some of the most negative words we encounter come from inside our own minds. And if anyone ever eavesdropped on our self-talk, they would be shocked by what they heard. But our self-talk does not have to be so discouraging. We can use it to validate ourselves like we would if we were coaching someone else, perhaps by using affirmations. There is a popular quote about how a lie told often enough becomes the truth. And this not only holds true if someone such as a politician repeatedly lies to us, but also if we repeatedly lie to ourselves. And while we might not feel as if we are strong or capable or confident, if we repeatedly lie and tell ourselves we are strong, capable and confident, these words will begin to develop a truth of their own, like a snowball rolling down a hill. Self-soothing. However vast and all-encompassing our thoughts and feelings may appear, we are really physical beings inhabiting a body, and our five senses provide excellent ways of distracting ourselves from dark, swirling thoughts and overwhelming emotions. And here it is important to find what works for us. The smell of baking bread may transport one person back to the safety and love they found in their grandmother's kitchen, while another may find a warm bath far more soothing. So we should experiment beforehand and then write down a list of what works for us, because we do not tend to think very well at those times when we really need to. Now keep in mind that self-soothing is a profound act of mindfulness because it draws us back into the present moment in a non-judgmental way. We can self-soothe through the use of sight. Here, such things as pets, plants, landscapes, sunrises and sunsets, starry skies, the wind causing leaves to dance, and other things we can see in the natural world can all have a profound therapeutic effect. Even just stopping and focusing all of our visual awareness on an ordinary object such as a pen can provide much needed distance from certain thoughts and feelings. Perhaps we can go for a walk with the intent of seeing something we have never really noticed before. Maybe we can even go online and do a search for color therapy and find which tones work best for us. Sound. There is a special connection between music and feelings, especially when it can transport us back in time. So we should come up with a list of songs that resonate deeply within ourselves and create a playlist that we can easily put on when we need it most. Maybe we can even pay special attention to a particular instrument or vocal track, even just focusing on the sound of traffic or something repetitive such as a tumble dryer can be enough to allow us to separate ourselves from our tumultuous thoughts and feelings. Smell. The sense of smell is the only sense directly hardwired into the brain and it does not need to go anywhere first to be processed. 
and can easily evoke long forgotten memories. Smells also have a way of subliminally affecting our feelings as the emerging field of aromatherapy has proven. We can light some incense, open a bottle of essential oil, inhale the scent of fresh laundry, peel an orange, smell food, do some baking. Perhaps we can even just close our eyes and focus our whole being on what we can smell as we deeply inhale. Taste. We often enter into a trance when we eat and end up paying so little attention to the fusion of tastes that enter our mouth. But when we slow this process down and become mindfully aware of specific tastes and flavors, we stop being so robotic. So we should not mindlessly scarf down a whole chocolate bar in a few seconds, but simply take a tiny piece and allow it to slowly melt in our mouth as we focus on it with all of our awareness. Eating with mindful awareness has even been proven to help those on a diet lose weight because we stop trying to fill that emptiness in our stomach through quantity and instead focus on the quality of our food. This is especially true if an eating disorder is connected to our inability to regulate our emotions. Touch. Touch is also one of our more elemental senses because it is not limited to a small part of our body, such as our eyes and ears, but can be experienced everywhere. However, since we have more sensory nerve endings in our hands and fingers than we do in our lower back, holding things in our hands and touching soothing objects with our fingers can be particularly effective. Perhaps we can stroke a cat or run our fingers along an object with a comforting texture. We can even put on clothes that have come straight out of the dryer or snuggle in a warm blanket or comforter and touching another person. Perhaps even running our fingers down our partner's arms or massaging the back of their neck can have a profound effect. Maybe we can even have a massage and focus on the soothing touch of oil and hands on our body. The key is to find what works and then do it when we need to. Another distress tolerance skill is pros and cons. Sometimes we are so caught up in life that we are unable to see things objectively, so it can really help to take a metaphorical step backwards and put things in perspective. This is where pros and cons come in, because this DBT skill requires us to sit down with the pen and paper and list all of the costs and benefits associated with a specific action. It also allows us to see that even the worst behavior fulfills some sort of need and has some benefits, though it will also show us that the costs will eventually outweigh the benefits. So we should think of all of the positive consequences that will come if we simply tolerate the distressful situation and do not fall into our old destructive patterns. And then to think of all of the negative consequences of falling into those old patterns, perhaps recalling events that happened in the past and then metaphorically weighing the two. Another distress tolerance skill is the TIP skills. The T stands for temperature change, the I for intense physical activity, and the P for paced breathing. Emotions are ultimately physiological and occur in the body, and they are connected to various biochemical processes within us. This means that through the strategic use of tip skills, it is possible 
for us to quickly override this process of emotional arousal because if we can change just one link in the chain, we can change the whole chain. There are two competing systems in the human body, one controlled by the sympathetic nervous system, which gears the body to fight or flee and is responsible for the rapid rise of certain emotions, and the other which is controlled by the parasympathetic nervous system, which turns this response off and lowers the intensity of emotional states. Tip skills can hack this process and help us to activate our parasympathetic nervous system. Here, it is important to note that tip skills work very fast to change our inner state, though we must engage in them as soon as we feel ourselves spinning out of control, because a certain apathy and feeling of helplessness arises once we have lost control. Though if we have a good support network and someone willing to help us, perhaps by filling a bucket with cold water for us to put our feet in or ask us to go for a run or pace our breathing, we can regain control. Tip skills are also ideal if we suddenly realize that we have an urge to hurt ourselves or engage in other risky behavior. They are also good for those times our minds seem to cloud over and we are not thinking correctly and are about to slip into old patterns because they can be like pressing, reboot, or restart. So the T of tip stands for temperature change. Research on drowning in cold water shows that when we get submerged in cold water, the dive reflex automatically takes over and lowers our heartbeat and calms us down so that our chances of surviving increase. So filling a sink with cold water and submerging our whole face from the chin right up to the ears and the top of our forehead for 30 to 60 seconds can activate this process and cause the parasympathetic nervous system to kick in and calm down our entire body. We can even simply hold an ice pack over our eyes, rub it on our forehead, or rub ice cubes on our wrists, the back of our neck, or under the cartoid arteries, that is, the arteries under our ears, just behind our jawbone that brings blood to our brain, though not for too long, or we can cause freezer burns. The eye of TIPS stands for intense physical activity. Intense aerobic activity such as jogging or hitting the gym has been proven to have a beneficial effect on our mood. When we really push ourselves, this overrides dark repetitive thoughts and feelings. It not only increases positive feelings, but also gives us a sense of accomplishment and empowerment and a feeling of mastery. One of the reasons this works so well is that emotional arousal is triggered by the activation of the sympathetic nervous system which triggers the fight or flee response and running or engaging in strenuous physical activity plays right into this process and channels it in a healthy way. Our bodies are programmed to be terrified of bears and quickly run from them, though not to run forever, but only until we are safe. A trip to the gym or a 20 minute run hacks into this process, allowing the parasympathetic nervous system to kick back in and calm our bodies once we have stopped. The P of TIPS stands for paced breathing. Research has shown that when we slow down our breathing, when we engage in deep abdominal breaths, and when we breathe out, at half the speed of which we breathe in. This has a similar effect on us as the dive reflex and causes our heart to slow down 
and the arousal suppressing parasympathetic nervous system to kick in and take over. Here, a simple formula of breathing in for a count of four and breathing out for a count of eight has proven ideal. And the great thing is that we only need to do this for three to five minutes. Another important skill we can learn to help us with distress tolerance is paired muscle relaxation. Learning to tense certain muscle groups when we breathe in and then relaxing these muscle groups when we breathe out has also been shown to have an effect on our emotions. This is a simple progressive muscle relaxation technique. The fight or flight response causes our muscles to be activated and fill with blood. And so by doing this exercise, we slowly take back control of our body. Here we should start high and work low. So start in the face, then move down to the arms, followed by the shoulders and chest, and finish with the legs. Another skill that has been particularly effective is radical acceptance. Within DBT, the major dialectic lies between the desire to change what can be changed and accept what cannot be changed. At first, it may seem like most things cannot be changed, but as one acquires these skills and learns how to use them, things in our life really do begin to change. It is as if there is a continuum between acceptance and change and that we can learn to move along this continuum. Though we will eventually encounter the dialectic again and realize that there are just some things in our life that cannot be changed and at this point they must simply be accepted. It is also one of the hardest skills to master because it can be extremely difficult to find that point where change is no longer possible and acceptance must kick in. And this brings us to the present moment because radical acceptance is also a mindfulness skill and this means that the focus must always be here and now in this moment. So if our car breaks down, rather than allow this to overwhelm us and call forth all sorts of negative emotions, we must accept it and not use it as an opportunity to psychologically bash ourselves or moan about fate and how we are so unlucky and just accept what is without the corrosive internal commentary. It can also be hard to accept the fact that we are suffering. Perhaps suffering has always caused us to seek out addictive substances to mask this feeling. Unfortunately, experience shows that by doing this, this just prolongs the suffering. So sometimes we must enter into a relationship with the suffering. Fortunately, by doing this, by radically accepting it, we can begin to move forward. If we can change the situation, we should change it. If that is not possible, but we can change how we perceive the situation by doing such things as reframing it, looking for a silver lining, or deriving meaning from it, we should do so. But when neither of these are possible, we must stop fighting it and stop judging it and simply accept it and experience it as mindfully as we can. This does not mean that we must approve of the situation or even like it, but just make peace with it. In Buddhism, the Buddha said life is suffering. Suffering grows from desire. Desire is caused by attachment. Therefore, the way to break free from suffering 
is to practice detachment. And detachment is one of the side effects of mindfulness, as we discussed in this segment on mindfulness. Most suffering is felt in the first person, and by this we mean it involves a why me? What did I do to deserve this? While the process of accepting allows us to inwardly detach into some place deeper within us, we can scream and cry because our tooth hurts, or we can simply inwardly detach and observe the pain and accept that things like this just happen. A car breaking down is simply a car breaking down. And if this means we cannot get to that job interview, it means we cannot get to that job interview. And there is nothing we can do to change this. It is reality and it is foolish to fight reality. Crying about our bad luck will not solve anything. And attempting to mask our emotions through drugs or alcohol will probably even make things worse because we will end up creating a vicious cycle where we drink to cope with the negative consequences of drinking. Perhaps we should have taken the car to the garage, but we did not. And beating ourselves up and getting mad at life will only make things worse. And so the only way forward is to stop judging and enter into the present moment and simply accept that what happened, happened and proceed from there. When we cannot shape reality to our will, it is better to simply accept it. And this brings us to the final distress tolerance skill we will be discussing here. The need to create a distress tolerance plan. As we mentioned earlier, it is not a good idea to wait until we are distressed to think about different ways we can cope. So we should come up with our own written plan. This involves not only writing out lists of things we can and have done to help ourselves deal with distress, but also rehearsing the various techniques beforehand so that we are familiar with them. And rather than worrying that some will not work when we need them, we should cast as big a net as possible so that we have a whole host of strategies available to us. So go online and do a little research on how to create a distress tolerance plan, and then go back through all of the skills we have gone through here and make your own plan. And here, it is important to make sure that it can be edited and updated so it can change as you change and then to keep it somewhere accessible so that you can easily access it when you need it most. Perhaps even keeping a digital copy on your smartphone or as an email attachment you have sent to yourself. The more we plan, the better prepared we will become. And the better prepared we are, the stronger we will grow. So think, plan, practice, and prepare so that primitive part of our brain does not take over and make us do stupid things. This is why training is so important in the military so that when a soldier encounters danger they do not lose control but fall back onto the skills they have developed through practice and training. Now in conclusion we would like you to practice some paced breathing where we breathe in for a count of four and then breathe out for a count of eight, making sure to expel as much air as we can from our lungs when we breathe out. So breathe in two, three, four, breathe out two, 
three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Breathe in, two, three, four. Breathe out, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Breathe in, two, three, four. Breathe out, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight.